Good evening. Jamaica reported 23 new cases of COVID-19 and one fatality yesterday, according to the latest statistics from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Now, this increases the total of COVID-19 cases since the start of the pandemic to 128,727 and the death toll now to 2,882. The country also recorded 98 new recoveries, increasing the total of recoveries to 80,984, while there are 224 confirmed active cases on the island. In other news tonight, the Ministry of Health and Wellness continues to encourage Jamaicans to get the coronavirus COVID-19 vaccine as the virus remains a threat globally. Portfolio Minister Dr. Christopher Tofton said that vaccine take-up has gotten slower as people perceive that the risk no longer exists or does not exist in a significant way as it did earlier. Imploring Jamaicans to get vaccinated, Dr. Tofton said that data collected over the last two years remains overwhelmingly convincing that vaccination saves lives. He reminded persons that vaccines are available at fixed sites as well as through mobile facilities island-wide. More than 1.39 million doses of vaccines have been administered to date, comprising 687,499 first doses, 578,893 second doses, and 91,565 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now a total of 3,514 doses have been administered to immunocompromised persons. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bissacer McKenzie informed that approximately 670,177 or 25% of Jamaicans are fully vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. The chief medical officer reiterated that an increase in vaccine take-up is critical in reducing the number of confirmed cases, the positivity and reproductive rates, and hospitalizations and deaths. Still making Mellow TV news, leader of the opposition and president of the People's National Party, Mark Golding, has called on the Prime Minister to call the local government election without delay. Here is Colleen May with more on this story. Leader of the Opposition and the People's National Party President Mark Golding yesterday at the PNP National Executive Council meeting in West Milan called on Prime Minister Andrew Holness to stop running away from the local government election and call it. We have councillors who have died. We have councillors who want, want to retire and get their pension. And we have people who have a right to choose their elected representatives in local government being denied that right for a long period of time beyond what the local government reforms of 2015-16 require. This was written into the law because of what used to happen where local government elections were often extended for long periods of time at the whim of the government of the day. And we reformed that and put local government in the constitution so that we would avoid situations like this. So I am calling on the government. We must call the local government elections without further delay. Stop running from it. Call it. It is profoundly undemocratic. And in fact, really abhorrent to say that you can't call a democratic election because you want to promote unity. Unity and democracy are not inconsistent. The opposition leader said that the pretext of using the COVID-19 pandemic as a reason for the delay at this time can hold water. In February, the government brought to Parliament a law to amend the Representation of People Act again so that they could postpone the calling of the local government elections for up to one more year. They are the ones who make that call, not us. This is the second time they are doing this. They did it February last year. So we now have a situation where the local government 
term of office, which is four years and is supposed to be a fixed cycle, has been extended not for one, but up to two years. We don't believe that the pretext of COVID holds water because so soon after they passed that law, the Prime Minister got rid of the DMRA orders and opened up the place again. The reality is that democracy and unity are not incompatible things. He's saying he don't want no election in the 60th anniversary year. Why not? Why not? An election is a one-day event with a short campaign before. We don't have political violence anymore in this country, thank God, because of the efforts made by prior leaders. There's no reason why we can't have a local government election this year. And we should have it now that COVID is not over, but we are treating it as if it is over. We must go ahead and call the local government elections. That is what the local government system requires. Mr. Golding said that he commends the Commissioner of Police on the force's success in recent weeks without the use of states of emergency. At the end of January, I had to put the Commissioner of Police on probation. Because he had been constantly saying that he can't do anything without a state of emergency. And that tool is just not in the toolbox. So what are you going to say? If you can't operate as commissioner with a tool that you don't have? Or without a tool that you don't have, I should say? So I said to him, listen, man. Either use the tools that you have, or let somebody else deal with the matter. Anyway, I'm happy to say that that talk seems to have had a response. Because soon thereafter, we start to see a whole heap of guns getting found all over the place without any SOE. And we see the murders rate coming down. Long may that continue, comrades. And I say to the Commissioner of Police, continue doing the work you're doing. Get the results that we all want to see, and I will extend your probation. We really cannot achieve sustainable reductions in the problem that we have with violent crime in the country unless we tackle the root causes of crime and violence. Reporting from Bello TV News, I'm Kelleen May. Thank you, Kelleen, for that report. And as we continue with the news tonight, 45-year-old Conroy Morgan, laborer of environs, for Paths Clarendon was fatally stabbed following an incident at his home in the parish yesterday. Reports coming into our news center are that at approximately 6.40 p.m., Morgan and a relative were at home when an argument developed between them. Morgan reportedly used a kitchen knife to stab the relative to his left hand, causing a wound that bled. The relative then took up a brown-handled kitchen knife and stabbed Morgan to the left side of his neck. He ran through the back door and collapsed. He was transported to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. Sources have revealed that Morgan's 15-year-old stepson was arrested in connection with the incident. The accused teenager was later apprehended by the police and is now being questioned. Still tonight, the Kingston Central Police are continuing their appeal to the public for assistance to identify the body of a man who was fatally shot by unknown assailants on Vincent Street in Almond Town, Kingston on February 27. The deceased is of brown complexion, slim build, approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall and has unkempt hair. Reports from the Kingston Central Police coming into our news center are that at approximately 11.20 a.m., residents heard explosions and summoned them. Upon the arrival of the law enforcement officers, the deceased was seen lying on his back in a gully in the community. He had gunshot wounds. He was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. Anyone who can assist with the victim's identity is being asked to contact the Kingston Central Police at 876-922-5076, Police Emergency 119, or the nearest police station. 
Still making the news tonight, a man from Kingston has been charged with conspiracy to commit murder after admitting to driving two gunmen to kill a man on 3rd Street in Greenwich Town, Kingston 11 on March 8. 24-year-old Shaquille Stanford of 3rd Street, Greenwich Town, Kingston 11, was the driver of the great Toyota Mark X motor car that was linked to the scene. Following a review of the Jamaica ICCTV footage. Reports are that at approximately 6 p.m., Derek Wright, a chef of 3rd Street, Kingston 11, was fatally shot while sitting along the roadway. He was pounced upon by armed men who shot him several times. The men were seen exiting the Toyota Mark X on Marcus Garvey Drive, where they also reboarded the same car following the murder. Investigations led to Stanford's apprehension on March 16 and the motor vehicle was seized. He was charged following an interview. His court date is being arranged. Senior Superintendent Kirk Ricketts, commanding officer for the St. Andrews South Police Division, said, quote, Commendations must be given to the team from the St. Andrews South Police Division who left no stone unturned in solving this murder. And although this is only one of three men who were involved in the incident, the investigation is ongoing. We want these and other criminals to know that we will not stop in our efforts to bring them to justice. End quote. Still making Mellow TV news tonight. Improved housing will improve behaviors, says Prime Minister Andrew Holness. This during the handing over of keys through the new social housing program to Ms. Clovis James, a resident in the constituency of Portland Western, represented by Daryl Vaz. Here is Colleen May with the details. The Prime Minister, who was delivering the keynote address at the handing over of a three-bedroom unit under the government's new social housing program in Orange Bay, Portland, recently said when children are raised in substandard conditions, it has negative impacts on their schooling. The gap in terms of what people would need, that is, the social housing, people who can't afford but are in really bad circumstances, people who can partially afford but would still need help, and those who can afford a house on the market, we estimate that if we are able to put 70,000 houses out there in addition to what the private sector is doing, we could create a serious revolution in shelter in Jamaica. The thinking is that if we improve the conditions under which people live, it will lift the general well-being of the society. But more importantly, if we could, by virtue of this housing thrust, just simply improve the living conditions, that could have an impact on children's learning. Mr. Holness said over time, it is expected that it will reduce the level of criminality in the society. And if children's learning improve, it will have an impact on their behavior. It could mean that less children make decisions to get involved in deviant behavior. That is joining a gang, early pregnancy, or participation in drugs, scamming. So that's the idea. And that will, over time, reduce the level of criminality in the society. So this, our housing program is indeed connected to our social justice issue, which is also connected to our crime issue. The Prime Minister said while the houses are free to the beneficiaries, the costs are borne by taxpayers. Miss Clovet James. Clovet, very pleased to hand over to you this three-bedroom solution. You are getting it free of cost, but this house is not free. This house is a cost to the Jamaican taxpayer. Everyone who is here who pay GCT, property tax, income tax, 
they paid for it. But it is an important transfer to you because the government and everyone here acknowledges that if one person in our society lives in subhuman habitation, it is a blot on the entire society. And there is a sense of equity and fairness in every Jamaican that would say the government should do all it can to assist those who have shelter solutions that are substandard. And that is what we are doing. We are going through and identifying the worst of the worst of the worst and intervening. Mr. Holness further outlined the process of providing these social housing. So we have committed to building these 70,000 units. Now, a part of that 70,000 units, the units that we're building, would be reserved for persons who live in the worst of the worst of the worst conditions. And we have seen them, we have gone through them, people have to be choosing which floorboard they, they, they can walk on. If it rain, they have to put up everything, including the chimney, to catch the water. And I see people nodding their head because they, 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 know, they know the situation. But they wouldn't be able to buy a house. So what we have done now, we have worked out a way how to deliver lower cost. They're not cheap, but they are affordable housing solutions to this segment of the housing market. And through the new social housing program, we have designs, so we have a template, we have a mechanism to ensure that we identify the beneficiaries. Now granted, the mechanism starts with the member of parliament identifying the beneficiaries. Reporting for Meadow TV News, I'm Colleen May. Thank you, Colleen, for that report. Public transportation operators and other commuters who traverse the St. Thomas to Kingston Main Road have received the first hint of what driving on the Southern Coastal Highway Improvement Project, SCHIP, will be like when the roadway is completed. Now, the National Works Agency, NWA, yesterday opened a section of the road in the vicinity of Grant Span. This means that persons will no longer traverse the rugged road that passes the entrance to the Grant Span community. According to the NWA, traffic is being diverted onto a section of the newly built roadway, adding that the diversion is being done to facilitate the commencement of works to create an embankment for the southern lanes in Grand Spen. And those are the stories making news. We now take a break and then join Christopher Scott with the very latest in sports. 